constantly going on and, and giving us new ideas or the latest gadget or, you know, in my case, the, the Apple Watch will make me happy. I know it won't, but, you know, there it is. That, that there's this, this sense around us that all of these ways are supposed to provide what we're hoping for, what we desire, the meaningful life, the joy, the purpose, all of that stuff. But so often what we find is we spend the money or we spend the time or we get the training or we get the raise or we get the promotion or whatever it is, and life is still the same. Our life is still the same. The way we feel is still the same. And the promise that we were given that somehow this would fix everything, this would make it all better, never quite materializes, never quite shows up, never quite really gets there. I still remember... Uh, relatively early on in my Christian life, um, I was uh, well. I was uh, on uh, in, on the college campus, and I was I was learning things through uh, through Campus Crusade for Christ as a college student, and and then even a little bit into my time on staff, I would get a new Christian book, you know, a new Christian book off the shelves out of the out of the, the little Christian bookstore. I told you about when Laura and I were in Athens, Ohio, serving at Ohio University, and. And there was the strip next to the university, and it was bar, bar, restaurant, bar, bar, drugstore, bar, little tiny Christian bookstore, which then apparently was, you know, like down in the catacombs or something. And, you know, you get down there, you're like, is the ceiling coming down? But that, that, was, that was our only kind of Christian bookstore in the little college town. And I remember I'd go there and, and I'd pick up a, a new book by, you know, Max Lucado or some other big name author and I'd read it and it was so profound and it would change my life. And then I'd go read another book and it would change my life. Then I'd go read another big Christian book and, you know, Charles would all, oh, it would change my life. And I, I began to feel like, you know, maybe there was something wrong with me that every time I read a new book, suddenly it was, you know, the windows opening and this is how I need to change. And, my campus director, Brian, had a great way of putting it. He says, you start out with no real filter about what's a good idea, what's a bad idea. You start out with no real filter of what your spiritual experience in your life is supposed to be like. And what's happening is that the pieces of that filter are starting to fall into place. And don't worry, later on you won't feel like that. It'll be more like as you read a new book, you recognize the parts that are already a part of your life or that you've read other places and disregarded, and you find a few good ideas to help you along. And the good news is, that's actually what's happened. So, you know, Laura doesn't have to contend with me suddenly going, oh, I need to change everything to fit this new idea of doing things anywhere near as much. But that idea that, that, as, as, that, that when we, we learn things about God, we learn things about our spiritual life, it, it leads to a change in our hearts. It leads to a different way of doing life. And it leads to an insight that shows us why what we've been trying hasn't been producing the satisfaction we desire. Why we've been really accepting a cultural or even a, a Christian culture substitute for what the Word of God really talks about. We've been accepting something less when it comes to our spiritual life. And in, in terms of this, sort of specifically, is this idea that there is work involved in getting to know God. You see, and, and it, we're kind of set up from it from the beginning, because when you think about when it comes to salvation, I mean, how does it work when we get saved? Well, we come to God, we confess that we have sinned and not lived up to what he wants, and then Jesus pays for the whole thing. And then we're saved. And it kind of sets us up to think that, oh, okay, so if that's the way it works when I first put my faith in Christ, then maybe that's the way my spiritual life I work also. That one of these days I'm going to figure out the right prayer, or I'm going to do the right thing, and poof, God's going to suddenly make me all spiritually mature, and I know everything I need to know, and everything's going to be the way it's supposed to. But what we find is though that forgiveness is instantaneous, and though that relationship with God that you begin is begun, and though he never leaves you and he'll take you to heaven one day, that the reality of getting closer to Christ, of having our lives be according to that, that plan that God has for us, experiencing the love and the plan of God the Father is actually something that instead of being an instantaneous gift, takes work to uncover and change and understand. And that's what Paul is talking about as he writes to the Colossians here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And, and what he does is he's trying to encourage them in the midst of that struggle and let them know that it really is worth it. 
a lot of times in our life, our, our problem is not so much that we, that we don't know what to do, but that we know what to do. We know the struggle we face. We know the effort we need to put forward. We know the change we need to make in our life. But our fear is that making that change will not be worth it. That somehow the cost benefit of it, we make that change and it won't really make things better. That we'll invest all this time in learning a new skill and then we won't be able to find a job in that new area of skill. That we'll invest all this time in a relationship and then that relationship will end up going nowhere. Or in a friendship and that friendship will end up disappearing. Or, you know, that person will, will get transferred to a new place and will have to start all over. That, that we hold back. And we don't want to put in the effort, we don't want to do it, we don't want to work on it because we're afraid that there won't really be a benefit in the end. That I'm going to put all this effort and time into my spiritual life, into getting to know Jesus better, into coming to church and having time with God and studying His Word and all of that. I'm going to put it all in and then at the end of the day, it's not really going to make a difference. It's not really going to make a change. That's what we're afraid of and it's why we hold back. And so what Paul wants to do is encourage the Colossians that it really will be worth it. That we really can trust God to give us that life within us as we pursue him. Now Colossians chapter 2 starting in verse 1 it says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining all the wealth that comes from a full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. That first verse there, Paul is talking to me, he says, I want you to understand how much I struggle for you, and for the church at Laodicea. Now what's going on here is that the church at Colossae, the church at Laodicea, they're in what's modern day Turkey. They're kind of up in this major trade route of the Roman Empire at that time. They've been very successful cities. They've got plenty of money going on, plenty of income happening, and that they're that but but that Paul has never been there. He's never been to either one of the cities that his missionary journeys led him in other directions, and someone else has planted those churches. Now he's heard from them, he's heard had letters from them, and he's replying to the problems that they're facing. And so the first thing he establishes is that idea that he cares about them even though he's not met them. That he loves them even though he's not met them. He talks in the, in the first chapter about how he prays for them regularly even though they're not personally known to him. And one of the realities of life as people who follow Christ is there are people you don't know, you've never heard of, you've never talked to, who are praying for you every day. There are people who are praying for this church all around the world on a regular basis that you've never met, but they're pulling for you, and you're on their hearts. And that when I share prayer requests them, uh, with them that we have, that they pray for those on a regular basis. That there are people that have, have been in my life, there are friends of my parents down in Florida that don't know anybody. That have not even met me, but that pray for our church, that are praying for our spring fling that's coming up, that pray for the people who have health needs that we bring up. One of the joys of being a Christian is we're in this giant network of people who are pulling for one another and wanting the best for one another. And, and that personal prejudice of only the people I like will I be nice to is not what's going on. That there's that willingness to, to put themselves out there emotionally on the part of those around them. And when you think about it, it only makes sense. There are not many of us in this room that know Scott Till or her daughter Paige. But we have been praying for him since before his liver transplant, continuing to pray. And we were saddened by the news of his death last week. That we have been invested in his life, even though almost all of us have never actually met Scott, have never actually met his wife Sandy. But we pray for them, we pull for them, they're on our hearts. And the amazing and wonderful thing is that the same God who hears us and who listens to our prayers is the same God that affects his life. That the same God that listens to the prayers of other people for us is the same God that affects our lives. And that through him we're connected with one another. And what Paul wants the people of Colossae to understand is that he is struggling for them and praying for them and loving them and willing now to take the time and write this letter and work out to try to figure out exactly what God wants to say to them. We can be encouraged 
that as we are seeking to know God better, there are countless people that we've never met that are in our corner praying for us, wanting us to succeed, backing us up, caring about our ability to draw nearer to God, our ability to have the life that is truly life within ourselves. And in those times when we're not strong enough to stand up for ourselves, in those times where we're not strong enough to pray for ourselves, in those times when we're not strong enough to be turning to God, they are turning to God on our behalf and supporting us and carrying us along in a supernatural way. The second thing we see Paul doing here is he says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. Jesus is God. We talked about that last week. If he is God, then he knows Everything. He's omniscient, that there's not any fact in the universe he's not aware of, that he doesn't understand. Jesus came and lived among us. He lived a life like our lives. He went through the pains and struggles that we go through. So not only does, does Jesus know like everything that's factually true, you know, everything that got downloaded in your computer, everything on, on the internet that, that is true, and then he knows the things that are scams are really scams, which some of us could do with more understanding of. But basically speaking, but what I'm saying here is not only does he know all the facts and all the stuff, he knows each of us. He knows our life. He knows what we go through. He has experienced the, the reality of life here on earth and the sorrows and the pains and the joys all wrapped up together. And this same Jesus who knows those things and understands those things is the one we're communicating with. We have confidence that if he is the God of the universe, he has all knowledge, all understanding, all wisdom. That when it comes to a question in our life, though we might have an idea about what to do, and our parents might have an idea about what to do, and our boss might have an idea about what we ought to do, and our children might have an idea about what we ought to do, that the idea Jesus has about how we should live our life, about the next step, is always the right one, is always the best one, is always the good one, is always the way forward that is most true and most wonderful and most proper. And we have access to him in that. That as we come to him in prayer, we lay out our life, that he actually communicates back. That he actually, through the Bible itself, we read things that lead us on the right path. That as we read his word and we talk to his people, we get advice and understanding in a way that it applies to the specifics of decisions we're making. The tough part about that is it takes work. That you can't just, you know, come up and ask the pastor a question and what's the proof text about this particular problem I'm facing in my life? Because usually it's more complex than that. You can't come up and go, well, what should I, what should I do with next month and when should I take my vacation? Not that most of you would ask me that question, but I guess what I'm saying is <coughs> that it takes work to understand the direction that Jesus has for our life. And that work is involved in getting to know him better and getting to know his word better and spending that time in prayer. And that the investment of doing so, well, it's like, you remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials? Where, you know, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens, and the whole place gets silent. Like when I tried to make a joke there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, those old commercials. And, and the idea was that this one guy, this one investment broker, this one company was so credible and knew so much and had so much understanding that when they spoke, everybody else knew that they were speaking the best way, the right way, the most authoritative way. And the idea is that Jesus is the one who, because he has all knowledge and he has all wisdom, understands what the next step is better than even we understand what the next step is. That he understands what, what may look like a wrong direction or not the best way or the, not the smartest or the wisest thing to do is sometimes the right thing to do. Maybe because it leads us to someone who will enrich our life, even though it takes away from our financial success. Maybe because this job is something that will be better for our family, if not necessarily better for climbing the ladder. Maybe because this job is, is better for me. I, I mean, it, 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 he 
because of who he is, has access to information that we do not. And so trusting in him and turning to him and studying his word and praying to him are the things that help shape our hearts in ways where we can make the decisions that are the decisions of God, the decisions God wants us to make. And what we can do is we can trust that when we do that, it really will be best. We can trust that the God of the universe truly is looking out for us and wants to communicate with us, and wants to help us down the path, and wants to give us that wisdom we need to live the life that is going to be the most amazing life that he has for us. But the only way that that happens is when we do turn to him, when we do give him control, when we do ask him to be the one in charge. And that brings us to a place where here in this last verse, Paul is continuing to write in verse 5, he says, For even though I am absent in body, Nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. The truth is that the work of finding Christ's will, the work of being near to God and hearing his voice and understanding it and living out the application of it, it involves discipline and stability of faith. Discipline is that discipline that, that not, not discipline in the sense of you are in trouble and when I catch you, you're going to get a tanning. It's not, you know, that discipline of, of when I figure out which one of you stole the cookies, you're going to be in trouble. It's discipline in the sense of self-discipline. The discipline of, of going to physical rehabilitation and going home and doing the exercises so that your ankle works properly again or the knee replacement functions the way it's supposed to. It's that discipline of going and, and, and getting out there and, and taking that jog or going to the gym and that discipline of, of making yourself physically what you're supposed to be, that discipline of, of taking the medication the right way or remembering to take your vitamins every day. It's that self-discipline that Paul is talking about here. And he's reminding us that our following of Christ is a matter of discipline. That, that progressing forward is something that doesn't happen automatically, as we talked about in Bible study Wednesday night, but it's something that we pursue, that we chase, that we run down, that we find, that we grab hold of, that we have to make happen. And that discipline is that willingness to keep on coming back to Christ when we mess up. That discipline is that willingness to keep on submitting our decisions to Christ, even when we know the answer might not be what we want it to be. It's that discipline that after we fail, we pick ourselves up and we go, God, I messed up and I'm sorry. Thank you, it's forgiven in Christ. But I still want to know your best choice for my life. I still want to know your best path for my life. I still want to know your best decision for this next decision I have to make. But it's not just an issue of discipline and that self-discipline to keep chasing God, it's an issue of stability. The reality is for all of us in our Christian life, no matter how close we are to God, no matter how well disciplined we are, no matter how intimate we feel with God, no matter how much we feel His presence in our hearts, there are times when that just goes away. There are times when when the circumstances surrounding us are so painful that it feels like God isn't really there. There are times that the most faithful, the most invested of people look at a situation that comes up and it makes them feel like God can't possibly be real. It makes them feel like God can't possibly care. And the thing about that is it's different for each one of us. There are different events. I mean, we're all familiar with medical issues that come up and that someone we love is taken from us or, or is harmed in a substantial way. But so often those things that cut deepest in our hearts are more personal than that. Our friends, where the friendship falls apart, our expectations at our job that never come through even though we think God has promised that they will. Our relationship with our parents or with our children where we want things to be different from the way they are and we're seeking to follow God and yet things don't come out the way we think they should. Stability in our faith is that ability in the moment of, of depression and frustration and disappointment going, you know what, this doesn't mean God isn't real. This doesn't mean God doesn't care. It might mean I didn't figure out what God really wants to have happen or what God really wants of me. But it doesn't mean that God has failed me. It doesn't mean that God has disregarded me or put me away or doesn't care anymore. What it means 
is it is an opportunity, a test, a trial, a moment to see in our own hearts whether we will cling closer to God in our frustration and sorrow or we'll walk further away from Him. Whether we'll <laughs> grab hold of Him, understanding that He's the only life raft out there and anything else we grab hold of is going to be a passing shark. That He is... Thank you. Um, but but that, that concept that, that Christ is the one when we grab hold of him, even when it seems like things aren't working out the way that he promised, even when it seems like things aren't becoming what we thought they ought to be, that he's still God. And his love for us hasn't changed. His forgiveness of us hasn't changed. His care about us hasn't changed. And his desire to be involved in our life and lead us in the best way possible has not changed. It just takes a direction we didn't expect. It just brings a tragedy into our life that is the foundation stone of something amazing in our life later on. It introduces a circumstance that allows us to minister to someone in a meaningful way five years down the road that is going to need our help, but we wouldn't be able to give it if we hadn't been through what we've been through. And God uses and does all of those things. And our, our fear in the moment is the sorrow we're facing There'll never be justification. There'll never be explanation. There'll never be enough of a, of a good outcome, quote unquote. And, and to some degree, that, that's emotionally true. But what we have as people who know Jesus is we can trust Him. That He will bring the very best thing out of it. That He will be worth the discipline and the stability of our faith and the maintaining and that holding on to Him. That he really is the life preserver that will get us through life and draw us into not just heaven someday, but a meaningful and purposeful and amazing life now. But it's through him. And not through our idea of him. Not through our plans that we've asked him to bless. Not through our self-created ideas about what he ought to be. But about who he really is. And discovering who he really is, is the thing that takes the discipline. The thing that takes everybody else praying for you and pulling for you and lifting you up. It's the thing that takes trusting in him to be the source of all knowledge and all wisdom. And the, the mystery of God, that ability to know through him what God desires. That the life, the life which is not full of substitutes. The life that is real life comes from pursuing Christ. And the bottom line is we can trust God with the work and the time and the effort it takes. That he will bring the reward, that he will bring the change, that he will bring the life that we then look back and go, it was worth it. What I've been through, what I've dealt with, the time I put in, the work that I did, it was worth it. And for each one of us, that outcome is going to be different. For each one of us, the way that he speaks to our heart is going to be different. But the one thing I want to encourage to you this morning is to make that discipline of following God a part of your life. Make that discipline of speaking with him and being with him a part of your life. And don't accept any substitute for that. Don't accept a hobby and the satisfaction that comes from it as a substitute for that. Don't accept your work as a substitute for real life. Don't accept money or a particular TV show or a particular definition of success or getting the right vacations or any of these other things. Keep that lens focused on Christ. Understanding that through your relationship with Him, it's what fills all these other things with their meaning and their purpose and their joy. And if that connection with Him is there, if that connection with Him is growing, then the fullness and the amazement of the rest of it go up with it as well. I want to encourage you, once again, stick with me. We've got three more weeks of talking about accepting no substitutes. I believe that's going to be worth it. Come Wednesday night if you can. We're talking about the habits of being a disciple. I appreciate the great feedback I've gotten so far, and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless.
but really what it comes down to. Make that commitment today to say, God, I'm going to pursue you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to trust you the work I do to find you and find what you want in my life will be worth it. It's my encouragement during our hymn of decision that as we sing, that as we worship God, you would make that commitment in your heart. I'm going to chase you, Jesus. I'm going to believe that it's going to be worth it. At this point, what we're going to do is we are going to receive our offering. This is the, the way that we keep things going around here. Um, and it's the way that we give God a part of what he's given us. Because in my experience and the experience of others I love, when we give and are generous is when we quit being stupid with our money. 